goals we'd like to have with this presentation. First one is to introduce to you maybe a new way to evaluate uh, devices. Uh, and um, hopefully this is something that uh, you will agree with me. It's, uh, it's a very challenging concept uh, when you have uh, the development of a new technology, how to assess the biological response of this technology. So I'll share with you uh, a, uh, the experience we have had uh, with um, using optical coherence tomography for that or intravascular imaging using the OCT technology. And, um, and the other concept is the introduction or the new frontiers in flow diversion, which is something we talked a little bit about earlier today. Which is, uh, what is the impact on the need of antiplatelet therapy? So the important thing about uh, these uh, concept is to see of course, the evolution, and uh, today we had the opportunity to see a discussion on uh, the preference of using steel coils uh, and something that we've been very familiar since 1990. But over the years, for one reason or another, there has been a need to develop new devices because there's such a wide variety of pathology that we treat. And um, the use of flow diversion uh, became available um, as a concept, I have to say, much earlier than 2011, but uh, it took a, a significant amount of testing. And I have to say to you that compared to many devices we have, I think that the amount of in vitro and, and understanding of how the performance, uh, mechanical performance of this device uh, uh, was done pr prior to approval and also the approval process, the types of trials that were done to get this device approval is um, it's, it's very unique on the aneurysm area. You know, in the aneurysm area, a lot of things have grandfather and you talk about clips or coils. There are no studies showing that uh, uh, the, this was actually the best therapy. It's all we had to, for the treatment kind of thing. But flow divergers had to prove themselves compared to the older therapies and not necessarily uh, something we see often. The only thing is being the biological response and how the coagulation control is done. And that's something that's been a challenge. But as you remember, we have used uh, uh, the concept of flow diversion is something that uh, I would like to, to challenge you. If you today could tell me what it means to have flow diversion is that uh, um, when you make a multiple stents uh, of low coverage together, you have an impact of, of uh, altering flow from uh, an aneurysm. Um, maybe you can do one device only, but flow diversion can happen in many different ways. And um, the modern era of flow diversion, it tends to be about 30% metal to artery ratio, uh, but uh, the um, this is something that uh, I will be glad to discuss and, uh, and hear your opinions on what means to have flow diversion. Um, I think that there's no question that uh, over the years we have worked uh, tremendously on the concept of uh, going from coronary stents to self-expanding stents and now flow diverters that are self-expanding uh, platform. But this is an evolution only on design. And we have not, um, you know, we, we, we basically ha have not seen what is the potential? What's the next frontier after developing so much these devices? What else can we do? And it's true that uh, the amount of trials that you have here also allowed us to understand quite a bit what the current devices do. And Premier, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this trial we just finished in the United States is to increase the indication from large and giant aneurysms to small aneurysms now. So flow diverters are going to be used in a very wide spectrum of indications nowadays. But then comes SHIELD, and SHIELD is, um, is basically starting with, uh, first in the pipeline platform, but likely will move on into different uh, platforms, is basically the concept of surface modification. Now, why this is so important is because if you look at uh, the um, uh, use of a flow diverter, uh, the way we know today, 30% uh, coverage, it has shown to us a tremendous um, improvement compared to the stenting coil uh, information that we had from before. There's not a head-to-head -head comparison, but uh, if you're able to uh, look at this table and you compare the trials that used um, the flow diverters, the main flaw of um, uh, the, the, the concept of flow diversion 
perhaps is we can do better on the complication rate, the morbidity and mortality, specifically thromboembolic events. So we saw earlier today uh, Dr. Hank is presenting a very complex, very uh, large series of co-diverters, and again, thromboembolic complications, even, even though it's an acceptable complication rate, we can still do better in there perhaps. So we have worked on design, but now how can we do better uh, in terms of protecting our complication rates? The main thing between standing coil or coiling alone uh, is uh, the issue of uh, durability at a, a, a complication rate that's acceptable. So this, this is the biggest advantage of flow diversion over any other um, uh, treatment that we have today for wide neck aneurysms is the about is the occlusion rate and sustainable occlusion rate being much uh, better. Um, this is a, a, a very interesting data from my study that pulled the data from all the um, uh, flow diverter trials using pipeline. It's about uh, over a thousand patients, uh, but multiple centers, and this is uh, basically showing to you pretty consistently across different studies that uh, over the years there is a progressive occlusion of the aneurysms and they tend to be durable and the retreatment rate being pretty low and major morbidity and mortality for a large and giant population aneurysms around 7% on this pool data. Now, so what is the biggest issue then? I mentioned to you many types of complications you've seen earlier today, many types of complications, but thromboembolic events, it's, uh, it's really the Achilles heel of uh, full diversion. So this is actually in, in a FDA database. You can see the biggest complaint about stents is uh, instant uh, thrombosis or thromboembolic events. So this is a big deal. The problem with this condition is that there's no one solution to it. And I, we will see later on today a talk on anticoagulation is that this is not about the, only the device. It has to do with the procedure, has to be with the patient. There are many conditions that affect the, thrombo the thrombotic state of a patient. So we have to look at, if you look at these different uh, circles here, the, the, where we, the strategies that we have to minimize thromboembolic events has to come as a multifactorial uh, type of situation. Um, now, I have to pose to you that um, inflow diversion, the next generation of uh, improvement probably will come from surface modification. And I would like to pose to you that intravascular imaging will help us also on this multifactorial uh, approach to decrease the number of complications we have with flow diversion. Okay, so why I think this is important is that uh, if you look at uh, the, the, flow, the, the surface modification issue, it, it's, it is something we can do. The technology exists for that. We have uh, in the coronary arteries already some proof of concept of uh, surface modification. So you're not coding the device. You're actually modifying how the device is made to decrease its uh, affinity to form clots, I guess, and look more like a, a red blood cell. That's the initial concept we have. So this is what this shield technology, by adding this PC polymer of the device, so you're not coding the device, the device is not changing in size. So this is a very important concept that, that you're not making the device harder to use. It, the device actually should perform the same way as the original device. You're just making the device um, in its constitution add this PC polymer to it. And that uh, seems to have an impact on decreasing uh, uh, thromboembolic uh, events or the affinity uh, of the blood um, coagulation cascade to be uh, to the to the device as implanted. So the stent or the flow diverter look like the outer membrane of a red blood cell. Um, this is uh, the the how this looks like. It basically um, uh, it, it incorporates into the braid of the stent this uh, this PC. Uh, and uh, uh, this PC polymer will be basically um, affecting that uh, thrombogenicity. Some of the studies in vitro, and this is one that's very, I uh, suggest you to take a look, uh, the uh, general neurointervention surgery showed this uh, in vitro study comparing the different uh, flow diverters, one with multi layers, one with single layer, one in using also dual antiplatelets and without dual antiplatelets to see the impact. And you can see here that uh, if you use uh, 
um, these are the different curves, and you look at comparison, the, the, the triangular one is um, uh, Fred, if you can have the, uh, the normal pipeline in the square, and the circle is the shield technology, the pipeline with the surface modification. And if you use no antiplatelets, you tend to have a separation between um, them. The, as you can see that the, the multi-layer tend to have a little bit more thromboembolic uh, uh, formation and that uh, the shield technologies, um, uh, it did better in vitro compared to the, uh, uh, to the regular pipeline. But if you have one antiplatelet, you can also have uh, that uh, separation. But if you use dual antiplatelets, that separation it doesn't have so much of an impact anymore. So it's showing that uh, there was a question earlier today, can you use a single antiplatelet in a hemorrhagic case and place a flow diverter like shield? There may be an advantage to that based on in vitro studies compared to the need to use dual antiplatelet. Uh, now, this is, um, I think, is very telling what is happening in vitro, but if you wanna see the picture of this, this is now fibrin deposition, and you can see the difference between different devices, and um, uh, clearly, there seem to be, a, uh, even within pipeline, shield versus regular pipeline, le also less fibrin deposition on the device. Okay, so now comes, we have the technology for surface modification, we have some in vitro studies. Um, let's move into the other area, which is the intravascular imaging and what, where we are with that today. I think the most exciting thing is that uh, this is what I'm gonna show you today is using a relatively large catheter, it's a San Jude product, but we have a wire, a 14 wire, that will provide us the same type of imaging, perhaps even better. Uh, and this is at the neural level. So a 14 wire malleable that can go intracranially, it allows us to obtain this type of uh, information. So imagine if when you did your uh, flow diverter placement, you could see this strut apposition like this. You could say, do you need to angioplasty or not? But this is nothing. I'll show you even more further analysis on this. You can also, not only in the acute phase when you deploy the device, analyze if it's a good uh, deployment. You can on follow up, see e how much the struts are being covered by endothelium. Um, the clear, there's a difference between IVAS and OCT, and I, I think this is a, kind of just shows you the spectrum where OCT is um, in terms of uh, the uh, type of imaging acquisition is a light-based acquisition, so you need to remove the blood in the time you obtain the image. So for you to do that, we have special techniques, but the faster the scan is done, allows us to minimize the time that you need to uh, remove the blood from the circuit. So an injection of contrast allows us to obtain an image during that time. Now, one of the challenges has been the circle willis because you can have blood coming from different directions. So we are learning more and more how to uh, improve our imaging. In our studies, this is the equipment we have used, uh, but as I mentioned to you, I'm not sure if I would start with this. I would wait until this new technology becomes available and you're able to use a much smaller catheter than you see here. This is a relatively large uh, uh, system, but the way this works is basically it, you place across the lesion and then the uh, inside of the wire or the catheter, uh, a light source will go um, up and down. This is a, in a cadaver. You can see the basal artery in a cadaver, and then you can see the light on going, moving down the vessel. So this is how the beam of artery scan, the, the light goes up and down the, cat, the wire or the catheter, and the image is obtained at the section where the light is as it goes up. But as you do this, you have to clean and with contrast or, or saline so that the image is clean. Sorry. So this is a little bit of a comparison between the intervascular ultrasound and OCT. On the, this is, OCT is at the level of histological information. So as you do an OCT imaging, you're looking at the vessel as intima media. You're, it's a different level of imaging. That's why I think that is the next level for us to decrease our complications. We're gonna see more. You can see the perforators, you can see, but the problem here is penetration. 
we cannot go too deep. So you have about a six to seven millimeter scan. So if the vessel is too big or there's an aneurysm attached to it, you may not be able to, to go deep enough into the aneurysm. In that sense, the IVAS does have a better technology in terms of how deep you can image the vessel. But uh, the precise vessel measurement, it's something that uh, you'll be pretty amazed how our conventional techniques are not giving us necessarily the best sizing. And we all know that sizing for full diverters does have an impact. Um, the other thing is this amazing image of uh, the origin of perforators and the interesting findings. I never knew that uh, a perforator didn't, the ostium, internal ostium and the external ostium were not exactly the same plane. They actually, there's a, the artery travels within the vessel wall and comes out in a different angle. So the internal ostium and the out, outside ostium of a perforator. So Naji showed us beautiful pictures of mini aneurysms on perforators beyond the vessel, but we cannot see in the vessel the perforator. And this is what we're seeing here. This picture is actually uh, in the vessel wall. You're observing the tract, the trajectory of a perforator. But this allows us to also see the relationship between uh, the, um, uh, the branches and the devices that we play. If we can actually choose, we also saw today top of the basilar full diverters. Maybe the nice thing would be to map that area and see the amount of perforators you have and decide what kind of coverage you can use. And if you talk about covert stents, even better, you can then choose which territories you can place that device based on a true imaging, allowing you to see what the vessel looks like. You can make diagnosis of injury, like intimal tear, as well as plaques, and, and if you're in a true lumen or not. Now, this is the look of a basal artery with a pipeline, and you can see the, the relationship of the different, the little tiny struts. So now you can design devices that will have the best shape into the vessel. We cannot see this type of picture very easily unless you do histology. But imagine this type of picture now in a very dynamic world that you can actually follow over time in the same uh, individual and the same animal in the case of our study. So this is a comparison between an enterprise and a um, uh, pipeline, how the difference between a low coverage, maybe a 6% metal to artery to a high coverage, 30% uh, metal to artery, the density of the struts is very different. And this is actually a case uh, that we're able to get uh, an IRB approval to do was a multiple stents uh, with coil in a, a human, a, li a live case that we had to stop the aspirin plavix. So we wanted to make sure that the endothelium had completely covered the, the, the construct. This was relatively early. It was uh, maybe about three months from the intervention. And the, you can see that the neointima had formed completely as uh, throughout the stent. We can actually measure at the length of the device uh, that it has been uh, completely healed and potentially be very safe to stop aspirin plavix. Now, this is, uh, of course, opens up to, if you go to bioabsorbable stents and different technologies that you can now follow up how the um, absorbing uh, uh, factor is taking place in the healing of the device. So imagine how much more we can do if we can actually see this. Now I would like to start focusing a little bit more on what we did, which is um, endothelization is very appealing to me. And I, we, this is an example comparing different devices and you can, this is the, 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 the stent you can see here, but you can see that this is the number of frames. So each study may have over 280 or 300 pictures of a millimeter difference of where the, the uh, a, a histological section. It's actually very difficult for you to do a histological comparison because the, the microtome cannot cut the, devi the device as close as the OCT can do. So you get much more views of the device. Now this is the example that uh, we found out to be uh, extremely relevant for the evaluation of new devices is if you have on day zero and day 21, and you bring this animal for studies in different time points, in this case was every week we were doing that, you can actually see in the same animal the growth of the tissue over the device over time. 
And this is what this is showing to you is basically going from no coverage to complete coverage of the device. And the, you also can see where the nail intimate starts in, in the healing. And this is now we're moving to a uh, better visualization of this with this type of reconstructions here. So this is a three-dimensional OCT. So you can see the total, the lumen of the artery, and then you can see the nail intima starting to cover the device until complete coverage. And that type of reconstruction is something that uh, allows us to think about other things. You can now do potentially uh, a flow dynamic study knowing exactly where the device is in place. So by knowing the, the strut position after deployment, you can use that for CFD calculations in a way that we couldn't do before. Most of this is done as a virtual modeling. And when you place a device, you place a fake device or a virtual device inside of the blood vessel. But having the true the detachment of the device measured like this allows us to give to the computational uh, calculation a much better idea of what, uh, how to simulate that. And this is the type of views you start seeing. Now, there's something very interesting about this, which is, uh, let me show you this picture here, which is a reconstruction of the device with the osteum of all the vessels that are in relation to the device. But the most exciting thing, and I think you really should pay attention to this. Look at this. This is the vessel. And right here you have in microns, the distance between the vessel opposition in, in microns to the, in the different parts of the stent. So if it's white, is well opposed, so you don't need to angioplasty. But if it's yellow or red, so you see the red area here, that means that it's more than 300 microns away from the wall of the artery. So if you have more than 300 microns in cardiology today, this is a indication for angioplasty. So you can actually get a quick view of the whole vessel with the stent deployed with color coding in the areas that uh, is separated from the blood vessel wall. And that will give you a, an incredible map of where it's relevant to angioplasty, not just angioplasty everything like we do today. So this is how it looks like. The white is well opposed. The yellow is um, a little bit less. It's about uh, uh, 200 microns. And red is 300 microns away from the vessel wall. This is how it looks. So 200 microns well opposed and 300 microns away. Now, this is another great view. This is with a FRED device across the anostium of a perforator. Look at how many little struts, because it's a braided device. So it has two, I'm sorry, it's a, uh, a multi-layer device. You can see the difference in the strut size across the ostium of uh, the uh, uh, perforator. And this is really interesting. You can measure, you can, and you can work on uh, understanding the relationship of this device to the ostium. This is a branch, not a perforator, but you can see the jailing of that branch and how little you cover the ostium of that. Uh, you can actually calculate the area that you've been covering your perforators and branches. Okay, now this is gonna go quick, but I, I wanted, this is really exciting though. I, 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 we, we had an opportunity to study shield versus pipeline versus solitaire. And we decided in an, in an animal model, you, you use a pig for that. And the pigs were, uh, we chose basically two groups, one with dual antiplatelets and the other one with single antiplatelets. And uh, so this is the protocol. They all receive, we, I don't know if you know how you give um, aspirin plavix to a pig, but uh, you, we use donuts. So you put inside of the donut and they eat the donut and the aspirin plavix. So it's kind of interesting. They have preference what kind of donuts they like, so it's very picky. Um, but this is how they look like. So this is in the lab. We are do general anesthesia for the angiogram. Um, this is our um, uh, procedure. You just get them prepped up there. This is the procedure, the endovascular part of it. This is uh, we use Navian, Marksman, and the OCT catheters from um, the Dragonfly Optis from um, uh, San Jude. And we randomized, so we didn't know, we placed in the carotid arteries, if it was flex, shield, and solitaire, we were um, uh, blinded to the shield and flex um, uh, combination. So this is uh, the system we use, over 14 guide wires, a 2.7 French catheter. 
So the main issue about uh, this, I won't discuss uh, too much the OCT process, but uh, the femoral artery access is a bit of a challenge sometimes. We would go ahead, do an early OCT post-deployment, and then we'll bring the animal in different time points up to 21 days. 21 days, everyone and them was completely healed. For the femoral artery, we usually tried, um, the cut down seems to be the, uh, the, the uh, best method to do. This is a little bit of the anatomy. We can go over that if you'd like to do it. But uh, the main thing here is that, uh, yes, the carotid artery is a very straight uh, shot to get there, and each animal got four devices, one, uh, two in each side. And um, this is how they look like post deployment, uh, the distal and the proximal one. And this is now us doing the uh, OCT during the, uh, um, this procedure. This is very important, which is the flow rate, the injection of contrast to clear the blood. It has to be, this is, there is a science to that, how much volume and what is the rate to use for that to happen. And these allow us to, this, to get these kind of pictures. You have the flex, the shield, and the solitaire. And this is in the different uh, regions. This is the one that we're looking at, 100 frames, uh, the 100 cut within the device. This is what these three devices is look like in the day um, uh, seven uh, close uh, placement. And this is now a day 21, showed complete coverage of the device um, and, and well healed. Um, the um, how this looks like uh, in, uh, in in how you compare and how beautiful I mean these images are very clear as you can see we're able to remove the blood very well there and this is um, now the beginning of neo intima growth at seven days you can see a little bit of neo intima over there you see that it's strut it has a little bit of coverage and it's very symmetrical on the shield and I'll go over this with you and this is at day 14 a little bit more and now at day 21, and you can see the angiogram and the DSA as well as the reconstruction matching very evenly how that uh, uh, growth of neo intima was, was happening. And then we did a histology, and even in the cases that there was thrombus, it correlated very well with the histology and the OCT. So I think this is a very good, uh, but of course, this is the limitation of histology is only one time point we are able to now obtain data from the acute stage all the way to the histology time uh, using OCT. This is an incredible finding, which is the growth of neo intima on top of the blood clots. And this is what uh, I think Dr. Henkes was alluding. Sometimes you'd see a stenosis that goes away. Maybe it was just clot on the wall of the stent. And we definitely saw that happening here. Um, so the... Um, let me describe to you what we measure, and this will show you the compare. So we measure the lumen area, which is the green line. The white line is the stent area. And then the, where we have the, this black arrow here is called the maximum thickness. And then in this area here, the red one is the minimum thickness. Now, this is uh, the definition from cardiology of what is uh, a coverage. The, and then the coverage struts are this type three and four. So you have uh, different ways this has been well established. So we follow that uh, cardiology convention. And we measure this type of, uh, uh, this is the data that I'm challenging you to say, maybe new devices should be evaluated like this, is the nil intimal ratio, which is the lumen minus the stent area divided by the stent area. The end the utilization ratio is the type three and four that I showed you. And this is um, the um, uh, important, uh, uh, how fast that happens. And the thickness ratio is uh, for an aneurysm, imagine is how much you separate the large, the lumen of the vessel to the aneurysm. And that is the minimum um, over the maximum week, um, thickness. Now, just to show you the OCT uh, data on the patients with single, uh, the animals with single antiplatelet that use. And this is the information we got. I will not, uh, I will kind of summarize this for you, but uh, I'll be glad to discuss this in more details if you have interest. But the interesting things about this were that uh, the neo intima formation um, over time, it was clear that uh, the, at day 21, everyone had neo intima. But from the beginning, which is very surprising to us, the surface modified device had the fastest growth of neo intima. And this is something that was against what I expected. I, I, I thought that the, the surface modification would delay 
the industrialization. This for an energy perhaps would not be a good idea, but in this case, it's seen that uh, we saw consistently uh, faster industrialization on the um, uh, shield device. But over time, it catches up and the other ones will heal. Now, the, there are many theories why this happens. It may be because the steps of healing are bypassed when you do a surface modification. The device is already pre-ready and can start industrialization at a faster pace than the ones that need to be first um, go from a, 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 a more premature state of healing, perhaps, by the surface modification may change that. Now, the no intimal formation percentage on each position over time. So we check the distal, middle, and proximal portion of the stents and compare if there was any healing happening in different locations. And that proved to be very random. So if you ask today where the industrialization starts in a device, you cannot say that starts from the edges. People say, oh, everybody says, oh, it starts from proximal and distal. It's a random process. You cannot uh, prove that consistently starts from each end. It, it, it randomly starts, and this suggests that this is something from the blood that implants on the device and then develops the inutilization, not that the, in, the inutilization starts from each uh, intima on each side of the device, um, which is an interesting finding for us too. Um, the other thing is, um, the uh, this is just going on the same type of information I just shared with you, it's very random how that happens. Uh, for each device, solitaire, flex, and shield, we saw the same random pattern of growth of no intima. Now, the no intima thickness ratio, it was uh, very important to say that the shield had uh, the most significant uh, thickness of no intima on day 21. And when you combine the uh, single and dual antiplatelet, and now you call, here you can look at the differences of thrombosis, Maybe this lower uh, part is the most interesting, and I'll, I'll summarize this for you as we move forward here. Um, the view, if you have single antiplatelet versus dual antiplatelets, the difference on the, the neo intimate ratio, you can definitely see that the, there may be a difference by using single antiplatelets on how the neo intimate heals over time. This is um, the graph showing the that there is an earlier initiation of endothelization on a shield device, and this was shown when you combine the groups also. Now, thrombus formation, that's the biggest question, I guess, is clear that like, uh, when we use single antiplatelets, the black one, the flex had 100% of thrombus on the stent struts, but in the shield had uh, a, uh, with a single antiplatelet, uh, much less, a significant less uh, 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 thrombosis, and if you use dual antiplatelets, then it becomes all equal. So it's hard to see the difference in surface modification when you're using dual antiplatelets. But if you use single antiplatelets, you see a difference between them. Now, to conclude, that uh, is basically, I'd like to challenge you if you think that uh, optical coherence tomography could be a new way to assess the new device, especially in the parent vessel. Um, I, I think that when it comes down to the shield in the utilization, we show that there is a tendency for earlier neo intimal formation. We also show that the volume of neo intimal formation over the shield in day 21 was not significant compared to flex. So over time, they become similar, but it, it starts sooner with the shield. We also noted that um, the, there's a more concentric, a more symmetric healing of the neo intima in the shield device compared to the other ones. And the pattern of neo intima formation is random. This is a very interesting finding. Uh, we also noted in the acute phase, there was 100% thrombosis in the flex device, and there's two out of six on the shield device, and that was uh, um, also an important finding. We changed the protocol because we saw in the acute phase thrombosis, so then we started giving dual antiplatelets, even though we had originally started single antiplatelets, because we had proved the point that there was a difference between them. So after we started doing dual antiplatelets, then the flex and pipeline shield behaved the same way. Uh, so there's no more thrombosis after dual antiplatelets were used. Thank you so much. I invite you to come to WNC in Los Angeles um, in May, 15 to 17. We're looking forward to a, a very lively discussion of cases. And I have to put a plug to Neurovascular Exchange, which is really an um, educational platform. It's a free um, online registration. I encourage you to check this out. And uh, 
this meeting is actually being broadcast live as we speak to this uh, site now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Demetrius, for this amazing presentation. Uh, have any questions in the audience? Well, first of all, uh, congratulations for this uh, great talk and this new new technique. Um, I was wondering, I have uh, a couple of questions. The, the first one is, do you think this technique, the OCT, it's useful uh, for make the diagnosis of uh, blister aneurysms? Because a lot of times uh, when we perform the angiography, we see those irregularities that we are not sure if it's a blister or not. What, what is your experience with this technique? I, I don't have experience with blisters, but I think that uh, the, uh, the this is the if we increase the safety. Unfortunately, it's an invasive method to prove that. Uh, maybe you can argue that the, having to do an angiogram. So the the fight here or the, the debate is between MRI wall imaging versus intravascular imaging. So if the non-invasive technology gets to a level that you can do imaging of the vessel wall with the MRI, which we're seeing more and more of that, perhaps that would be the preferred method for that in an acute case. But no doubt you have a histological information. You could argue even to do a screening of vessels to see where there is two layers versus three layers, for example. So predisposed if you have familial aneurysms, you know, and you can actually make an argument for that perhaps. This is far from where we are now. I think that the initial application of this will be mainly on treated cases to follow endothelization and so forth. But I think that the, the images are incredible, and but it's an invasive method to do so. So you have to balance that. Uh, thank you, uh, Demetrius. Uh, what do you, why, the, why you are the different thickness of endothelization? Do you think it's through the flow component, change of the flow, or why? Why is different? Uh, I see in the image that you are more, more, uh, more uh, endothelization, no, in the neck, in another side. Why? Uh, well, I, I think that uh, the response uh, we're learning from this, but uh, it, it, what's interesting for me is that. Uh, I don't know if there was uh, more opposition against the wall causing more response. So if we see this in carotids, if you place a carotid stent, many times looks on follow-up that the stent is outside of the vessel and the contrast column is in the middle, but there is a thickness of no intima that grew. It, there's a tendency for the blood vessel to reconstruct the no intima to the original size of the vessel. So if you have oversized stent, it will narrow enough, it's called late loss, which is the growth of neo intima inside of the device to compensate for whatever radial force that you apply against or angioplasty or, or stent force. So it may be a component of that. Uh, we noticed that not only there was a difference in, in growth in neo intima, but also the symmetry of the 360. Sometimes there is thicker, is thicker in one side and thinner on the other side on the same cut. And we don't understand that very well. It could be that there is clot in the in the stent, and that made the neo intima grow over that. It became more. So we saw in some cases that as an explanation. There was a coverage of neo intima over clot. And the other reason may be uh, related to the strength of the opposition or how the device is deployed. Technical issue, maybe. Okay. Uh, the second question is when do when. I stop the endothelization. How many days? How many? So in you, you, you are there is to do this? Yes. Yeah, so in, in the animal model, it's 21 days. But uh, one in, day to start and stop? Then then we stop, yeah. But uh, it, once you finish complete coverage of the device, we didn't see any, I mean, we didn't follow long enough to see if there was overgrowth of uh, no intima. Perhaps you could argue that it could look longer for stenosis then. Uh, so we, this study didn't mean to look into that, but uh, I think that um, it's an interesting question. If we had a device that caused a lot of uh, uh, long-term stenosis, we could try to study when that happens, and I think that's a possibility. Uh, finally, I suggest you it's possible to 
to to put the the, the endovascular device to, to see the ultrasound to see the, the endothelialization is possible to, to to put this material and no remove you wait uh, one week and you learn you need what grow the <laughs> is possible this I, I think it would be uh, not advisable because of uh, the um, the, in the, the vascular access, you'd have to be still, right now is not a, a, a wireless situation, so you would have to be coming outside of the body. So the patient would be very limited in what they can do. In an animal study, it's hard to justify that type of, uh, even the multiple angiograms. So if you ask me, what was the biggest barrier we had? Well, number one was to get all the devices and the cost of this, but the other one was the issue of, uh, the, to convince the IRB of um, a, a, a project that you have to do multiple interventions, it's a bit of a challenge sometimes. And uh, But I think that uh, if we show the reason why we're doing this, this is incredible information. We never knew before where the endothelium starts to grow. You know, this is news information. We also don't know the impact of, of a new device surface modification. So I think that uh, if we have a relevant question like that, it's justified to do multiple studies. I don't think that leaving uh, the wire in place will allow the mobility between the time points. Um, you can extrapolate if it's something that heals very fast, like your stem cells or something, maybe you can argue that uh, I wanna monitor in an hourly basis and then you can justify a design that you could do this. The issues would be the anticoagulation that you have to have and the mobility and the anesthesia time. You know, a pig, you know, you, once you wake them up, they're not gonna hold, they're gonna be all over the place, you know, and I think that's the limitation of that. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitris.